These are the spiders in your house. Hello again, YouTube. Now, a few of you have asked for this one, and a lot of you have asked for a jumping spider in general. Now, this is one I normally find outside, but it does show up indoors from time to time. Now, this one's nice because it's fairly easy to identify. It's pretty cute, really, and there's a ton of stuff about it that you just can't make up. So today I'm covering Salticus Senecus, the zebra jumper. If you're new to this channel, I'm Travis. I'm an amateur spider enthusiast. Do I get to call myself an amateur arachnologist? I don't know. And here on the channel, I try to help you identify and understand the spiders you might find in your house. Now, lots of people have seen these and recognized them, but probably still have questions like, does it bite? Is it dangerous? How does it climb and jump like that? Does it dream of my demise? Turns out that last one may be a more valid question than you think. And I'm going to answer all of that, but I'm also going to get into the actual mechanics of how it sees, how it jumps, and some of the newer research that gives us an idea of just how intelligent these creatures are. So even if you already think jumping spiders are pretty cool, believe me, these are even cooler than you think. Of course, first I need to thank the people who made this video possible. So thanks to Rick Vetter, who went through his own personal data to dig up some information for me. Dr. Daniela Rossler, who kindly answered some questions for me about her own research. And of course, Dr. Catherine Scott and Dr. Sean McCann, who have given me a ton of guidance, both in research and in general spidering know-how. Also to all of my patrons on Patreon who support this channel, and a really big thank you to the Tier 2 patrons, Emily Callio, Cameron Liggett, Tinker, James Serio, Lisa Reich, Tobias Trill, Megan Humphreys, Wynn Lippett, Otter, Signa Cruz, Tom Kerr, Foxell, and Silverwilt. Thank you so much. I'm stepping up what I'm putting up there on Patreon for you guys. There's extra stuff there. And of course, all of you who have been watching my videos, commenting, subscribing, helping the channel grow, thank you all. And if you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and check out the Patreon page. It'll help me keep doing this for longer. So, into it. This spider was first described by the Swedish arachnologist Carl Alexander Clerk in 1757, when he wrote and published Svenska Spindlar, or Swedish Spiders, which detailed 67 species of spider known in Sweden. These 67 spiders became the first animals in modern zoology to have proper binomial names, as Carl Linnaeus formalized the Latin binomial system only a couple of years later. So, we've recognized this spider as a species for over 250 years. Originally, Clerk called it Arrhenius Senecus, and it wasn't until 1901 when Simone rebranded it as Salticus Senecus, the name we know it by today. Salticus meaning dancing, and Senecus meaning theatrical. So let's have a look at it. As spiders go, this one is pretty easy to identify fairly reliably. As usual, we'll start off with the prosoma, the sort of head where all the legs attach to. It's mostly black, with a white border around the edge, and this white sort of unibrow just above the main eyes, and this couple of marks behind those. The epistosoma, or the abdomen, basically the butt part, is black, with these four white stripes across it. Now, they don't run straight across the abdomen. They sort of slope, especially the last one, and the middle two don't quite fully meet in the middle. So, other species in the Salticus genus will have these bands running straight across very continuously, while in this species, these two are broken. The legs are black and banded in white, as are the pedipalps, these sort of mini-leg feeler-looking things. So, if you've got all of these things, you can be pretty sure you've got Salticus senecus. This one's a mature male. Now, look at the size of these chelicerae. These are the moving mouth parts and the fangs are attached on the end of them and tucked back up alongside them. They're huge on the mature males, which is a feature not seen on most jumping spider species. Here they are on a female, and you can see they're normal-sized on the ladies. The gentleman spiders actually have to keep their pedipalps between them because they can't get them in front of them. Sort of a manspreading situation here, except the spiders actually have a halfway decent excuse. And these are not large spiders. The females only get to about 6.5 millimeters in body length, and the males to only about 5.5, so 
You're looking at about a quarter inch of body and not a lot more in legs as jumping spiders have characteristically short legs. Where will you find them? Well, these spiders have a pretty wide distribution. They occupy sort of a strip in the northern hemisphere that includes basically the entire United States, except Alaska, most of Canada, except for the northern middle, most of Europe, and much of Asia. Southern hemisphere folks, you're out of luck on this one, sorry. They prefer vertical spaces, and they seem to really love the sun, and you will occasionally find them inside as well. Speaking of weird places they've been, one of these went to space. Back in 2012, YouTube held the YouTube Space Lab competition, giving 14 to 18 year olds the chance to submit their ideas for experiments to be done in zero gravity aboard the International Space Station. 18 year old Amr Mohammed from Egypt proposed taking jumping spiders to space and observing whether they could hunt in zero gravity. So a female Saltica Senecus named Cleopatra and a female Phidippus named Nefertiti were taken to space and observed by astronauts. Both spiders did manage to hunt and feed in space, but unfortunately, Cleopatra's behavior wasn't recorded. Nefertiti, the Phidippus, ended up getting all the camera time. Typical Phidippus, always hogging the spotlight. Cleopatra sadly died during the return to Earth, but we do know she managed to catch prey, even when she didn't know which way was up. Speaking of prey, what do these spiders eat? Well, they eat a lot of things, sometimes including other spiders. This female here is enjoying the fruit fly I gave her. But this part might just make you love these spiders even more. A 2007 study by Toshinori Okayama observed zebra jumpers outdoors for four months in south central Nebraska. When he saw them with prey, 57% of the time that prey was an insect from the family Calicidae. But Travis, you say, why is that even remotely exciting? Calicity are, bum bum bum, mosquitoes. More than half of their diet was these little jerks. In the case of Phidippus odax, the bull jumping spider, only 19% of their diet was mosquitoes. Take that, Phidippus, you slackers. Just kidding. I, I love Phidippus, but they do seem to get all the love. So the zebra jumper in particular seems to be especially good at taking out the little twerps that do their level best to take every bit of joy out of your summer. You love them just a little bit more now, don't you? General taxonomy. So where do these spiders fall in the larger spider organization? Jumping spiders make up the family Salticidae. There are two main things that make Salticids Salticids. One, they specialize in jumping, which is kind of a no-brainer. The other is the eyes, which of course is what makes people love these little guys. Even the Dark Lord Sauron would have to be clinically depressed to not be cheered up by a close-up view of these things. They're just adorable. Most spiders have eight eyes that all sort of suck. Salticids have six eyes that are pretty good at spotting moving objects, and two enormous ones that are phenomenal at actually seeing things in detail. So it's a pretty distinctive eye arrangement, and it's hard to mistake jumping spiders for any other kind of spider. I'll get into the eyes themselves a little later, because that's its own discussion. Anyway, you have the Salticity family, and within that, the Salticus genus, and then among that genus, the species Salticus senecus. What about in your house? These spiders are really primarily an outdoor spider, but they can and do venture indoors sometimes. So what can you expect if some of these spiders start sharing your home? Well, if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll be familiar with my general measures of house spider politeness. Webs, do they make a mess? Movement, will they show up unexpectedly or do they stay put? And bitiness, do they bite, how often, and how dangerous is a bite? We'll start with the webs. So these spiders generally don't make webs for prey capture, so they won't make messy cobwebs in the corners. They do leave a single drag line behind them as they roam around, which is so thin you'll never notice it. And they sometimes make little silk retreats that they sleep in, which are usually somewhat hidden and out of sight. So very tidy, considerate spiders in that regard. So far, so good. Movement. So this is not a spider that stays in one place. Jumping spiders are active hunters, so they constantly move around looking for things to snack on. And they're a diurnal species, meaning that they're active during the day, not the night. 
So they'll show up on a windowsill or wall or ceiling in the middle of the day, like when you're half awake eating toast in your bathrobe. Once it gets dark enough, though, just like us, they kind of decide, well, that's enough for one day. I am lit tired, and put themselves to bed. And even when they do show up unexpectedly, they're quite small. So while it might be a surprise, it will only be frightening to the most severe arachnophobes. Bitiness. Now, I looked for published work on this, but came up virtually empty. So I wrote to Rick Vetter, who spent much of his career studying spider bites, to see if he knew of any cases he could point me to. In all, he found six cases, all of them from Phytopus jumping spiders, a genus that's much larger than Celticus, but there was nothing on the zebra. And Vetter said in his email, I would say smaller Salticids like Salticus either don't have the ability to bite, or evolutionarily were of a size where biting as a defense was not a feasible trait to develop. But let's be overcautious for a second here and look at the effects of the Phytopus bites. One of the six, described in a 1970 paper by Finley Russell, resulted in a fair bit of pain, swelling, and itchiness on the hand where the person was bitten. The swelling extended to the fingers and lasted four days, and the pain for nine. It took two weeks for the bite to completely heal. But this was the very worst one. In all of the others, the bite felt like a bee sting or a pin pinch, the pain lasted for a day or two, and that was about it. There was no nausea or sickness or muscular effects or anything like what we would see from a medically significant spider. So the bites we have on record from much larger relatives of the spider are few and far between to begin with, and are no big deal when they do happen. And as you can see here, these spiders really aren't inclined to bite humans at all, unless they're really threatened. They can see you, they know how big you are, and they're smart enough to know that they can't take you. So they're really not interested in biting. I'd rate these very well on the bitiness factor as a, you really don't need to worry about these spider. So I wanted to move through that stuff sort of quickly because this isn't a spider that usually worries people. There are two things about jumping spiders that tend to get people's attention. Their jumpingness and their eyes. So we'll start with those things and then get into all the other stuff you probably never thought about that makes these spiders super cool. Jumpingness. Obviously, this is kind of the defining feature of these little marvels of creation. There are two elements to these jumps, speed and accuracy. If you've ever tried to catch a fly on a wall with your hand, you'll know that that futile endeavor generally only ends in rage, a wounded ego, and a new nemesis. And yet, jumping spiders do it all the time, so they're clearly faster than we are. A 2021 study led by Dr. Ava Chen recorded high-speed video of zebra jumping spiders hopping across 3 centimeter gaps with a takeoff velocity of around 700 millimeters per second. Assuming a generous body length of about 6 millimeters for this spider, that's 116 body lengths per second. If I don't include my legs, my body length is about 1 meter. So that's like me just getting set and then rocketing myself away at 116 meters per second. Times 60, times 60, divide by 1,000. That's about 417 kilometers an hour. Or for the Americans watching, 261 miles per hour. Which is insane. And there's a lot going on in that jump. What Chen and her team were actually looking at in that 2021 study was the spider's production of silk during the jump. These spiders normally jump with a safety line, and they leave a drag line of silk basically everywhere they go, so they can catch themselves if they fall. The thing is, the silk drag line is actually produced as they move through the air, so they're spinning that line as fast as they're jumping. Previous studies on other spiders had found that silk spun at more than walking or web building speeds was of lower quality, but that wasn't the case with these spiders. In fact, Chen's team found that the jump spun silk of these spiders was among the toughest silk ever recorded in any spider species, being tougher than even the shock absorbing lines in the webs of orb weavers. In 2013, Young Kang Chen, a different Chen, had looked at how exactly this safety line was being used as, well, much more than just a safety line. Chen's team looked closely at flights and landings of Hasarius adansoni, the Adanson's house jumper, 
a species common in Taiwan, and it's a fairly safe bet this will hold true across most jumping spider species, including our zebra jumper here. They tested 27 spiders, five of which for some reason didn't attach dragline silk before they jumped, so they were able to compare jumps and landings of spiders with draglines and spiders without. Now spiders are able to break on a dragline, though we're not totally sure just how they do it. Chen's team looked at how this breaking on the dragline affected the actual dynamics of flight and landing. So this is where I break out my kids' toys again for science. I'm lying. This is mine. Yes, I'm a Lego nerd. When jumping spiders take off, they begin to pitch backwards, and you can see that happening here when we look at the slow motion. On longer jumps, they'll start breaking toward the end of the jump, which pitches them back forward and into a better orientation for capturing prey or landing. Turns out, it's not as simple as that. Chen's team found that these spiders were undergoing multiple pitch reversals, not just counteracting the initial backward pitch. So the drag line is used to stabilize the spider's body throughout the jump. Spiders with no drag line would hit the ground harder, faster, and were prone to slipping and tumbling. The controlled use of the drag line allowed the spiders to slow themselves down while in the air, orient themselves correctly, and stick the landing like Natasha Romanov arriving at a police station. Now, I wish I had the other fence post in the frame on this jump, because believe it or not, Captain Levi here actually stuck this landing after this crazy maneuver. And you can see that taut drag line behind him. Now, this work was building on some substantial work that had come before. In 1978, David Hill began researching the jump dynamics of salticids. Hill's work turned into a decades-long project, starting off with strobe photography of Phytopus spiders, with photos measured by hand for the data, then being re-evaluated decades later with the aid of computer technology. Hill's work probably gives us the best understanding of not only how these spiders jump, but what they're capable of understanding and calculating before they even pull the trigger. He tested spiders jumping straight on the horizontal and at different distances, then at different downward angles at different distances, measuring both takeoff velocities and takeoff angles. Now these are ballistic flights that follow an arc, just like throwing a football through the air. He found that when spiders were jumping at a target below them, at a downward angle, they jumped more slowly, understanding that gravity would affect their trajectory. On the horizontal, more distant targets resulted in higher takeoff angles and greater takeoff speeds. Basically, these spiders were able to make these jumps the same way a pro NBA player controls the speed and angle of a basketball when shooting from a distance. Even jumping from vertical surfaces, they can put a bit of roll into their flight so that they end up oriented correctly by the time they get to the target. Now watch this strike here as the spider leaps off the upper surface. Now watch it at 1 40th speed. You can see the spider roll into a better orientation, and you can see her fangs extend before she actually gets there. And in the case of leaping at larger prey, they extend their legs into a catching basket just before they arrive, wrapping their legs around the prey as they hit it. Now making these accurate jumps requires two key pieces of information. One is knowing which way is up, which these spiders can apparently sense somehow, so they know how gravity will affect the jump. The other is correctly gauging the distance to the target, whether it's prey or simply another position. Now this is done with the eyes, but not the ones you would think. Those huge principal eyes, known as the anterior median eyes, have some exceptional acuity and can see great detail, and they're constructed in the same way that a modern telephoto lens is. So they see fantastic detail, but have a very narrow field of view, sort of like looking through a paper towel tube. The eyes right next to them though, known as the anterior lateral eyes, are much further apart, have a wider field of view, and importantly, their fields of view overlap each other, giving the spider binocular vision. All the way back in 1928, Heinrich Hohmann, the famed German zoologist, demonstrated that blinding just one of these anterior lateral eyes dramatically reduced the accuracy of these spiders' jumps. In fact, it reduced it just as much as blinding both of them did. 
So the evidence all suggests that these eyes are the rangefinders, while the principal eyes are the target identifiers. So let's talk about those principal eyes that make these spiders such darlings of the internet. The principal eyes have multiple layers to their retinas, one in front of the other, which probably allows them to see in color. This makes sense, as many jumping spiders are brightly colored and seem to display these colors in courtship dances. Now, I already mentioned that these eyes are basically telephoto lenses, with narrow fields of view. But that narrow field is somewhat made up for by the fact that these eyes, unlike the others, can look around. In humans, the entire eyeball moves in its socket, but in these spiders, the retina moves back and forth while the main lens stays in place. So they can sit still and scan a scene with those powerful eyes, track a moving object, and examine it in detail. In fact, they can move those retinas independently of each other except they do it a lot better. The other six eyes can't look around like this, but they do give the spider basically 360 degree vision. All of these secondary eyes lack the sharp detail that those main ones do, but they seem particularly attuned to moving objects. And that brings us to how these spiders actually hunt. A 1975 study by Lawrence Dill found that zebra jumpers would turn toward a moving object once that object occupied a certain amount of the spider's field of vision, about five and a half degrees. Which makes sense, as a lot of the time the spider might only be able to see the object with one eye at a time, and wouldn't be able to calculate the distance. So smaller prey would have to be closer, while larger prey could cause this turn, called orientation, from further out. Now it didn't seem to matter how fast the prey was moving, it only mattered that it was moving. Once the spider notices the moving object, it turns to put its big main eyes on it and examine it. And the spiders seemed completely capable of telling actual prey from inanimate objects. Dill started by using a moving flat black bead to get the spiders to respond. Now while most of the spiders would turn to examine the bead as it approached, they didn't often try to stalk it. When Dill replaced the bead with a simulated fly, suddenly the spiders took interest and started actually approaching it. Now he measured the speed at which the spiders approached the prey. In some animals, a runaway response is generated when the size of the arc an object occupies increases above a certain rate. So a predator can move toward it more quickly when it's further away, but would have to slow down once it got closer to keep its rate of increase below that threshold. Zebra jumpers apparently understand this, and they approach more slowly the closer they get. They also don't always move directly toward the prey. If it's larger, they might actually circle around it to approach from behind, like this one did. And you can watch him stalk this insect pretty cautiously. Be oh, don't be Don't be Weirdly, he let this bug go after he pounced on it, like he was disappointed once he had it. Kind of like when you bite into a chocolate chip cookie and then realize those are actually raisins. Anyway, they plan these stalks out pretty cunningly and they usually close to an average distance of about 11 millimeters before actually pouncing. Now these spiders are solitary hunters and they don't appreciate company, and mostly they avoid each other. Most of the time, a moving spider will back off from a stationary one after some posturing, sort of an I got here first rule. I tried putting these two together as they appeared to be an adult female and an adult male. They definitely eyed each other up a lot, but neither one tried to attack. I was hoping to see some courtship behavior, but I think this was more defensive. Now here you can see the male open up his chelicery and front legs as the female gets closer. He's flexing his muscles, putting on a show, but it didn't last long and she didn't seem that impressed. I do love how he loses his footing and falls here, and across the enclosure she's just sitting there watching him like, yeah, that was smooth, hotshot. Then he walks right past her like he's trying to pretend that didn't just happen. Classic. He did follow her around a bit, so maybe he was looking to flirt a little. Does this flexing thing again here. Now I love this one here. She's just walking by and he's all, hey baby. She's got spider stuff to do. She ignores the cat call and gets on with her day. 
He's left looking confused like he can't understand how that didn't work. They're really not that different from us, are they? Now he falls again here while trying to get her attention. And she approaches him. It's like she's thinking, oh, I'm gonna have to deal with this guy. She comes right over to him, like this is the closest thing to a conversation they're ever gonna have, gives him a piece of her mind, and then walks away. And he's all, so I'll see you around then? So not a lot happened there, but it did seem clear that they didn't consider each other prey. They identified they were the same species of spider and definitely interacted. The guy seemed sort of afraid of girls, and the gal apparently had standards. Now, a lot of people are baffled at how these spiders can effortlessly scale smooth glass. Some spiders would struggle to climb smooth surfaces like plastic or glass, but these ones can handle those surfaces like they just don't care which way is down. Now, spider feet are kind of amazing. They do have claws. Most spiders have either two or three claws at the tip of each leg, but the claws aren't what's doing the work here. Some spiders have something called claw tufts, which are dense cushions of hairs called scopulae directly under the claws. On the ends of each of those hairs, though, there's a whole bunch of even tinier hair-like structures called setules, or end feet, depending on who you're reading. In 1991, Roscoe and Walker studied the feet of the zebra jumper, and they found that each claw tuft has on average 40 of these scopula hairs and each of its scopula hairs has about 660 of these end feet. So let's see, 40 times 660, and of course there's eight of these. So one of these spiders on a window doesn't have eight points of contact with the surface. It's got 211,000. And at each of these 211,000 points of contact, probably two forces are at play. One is capillary force, as in the natural world, virtually everything has a very fine film of water on it. And that fine film is enough to create enough capillary force to hold several times the spider's weight. Teflon foil, however, lacks this film. And as Reiner Felix points out, on Teflon foil, even spiders that can walk upside down on glass plates begin to slip and fall. But Roscoe and Walker found that Salticus senecus could, in fact, walk upside down on a Teflon sheet with no difficulty, and even tapping on the sheet didn't dislodge it. Which brings us to the other force at play, something called van der Waals forces, which are kind of like gravity, but operating at the molecular level. They're very slight forces that make molecules attract each other when they're close enough, as is the case with these little end feet. Add enough of these tiny forces up, say 211,000 of them, and they're enough to support over a hundred times the spider's own weight. So that's how these spiders are hanging on. Now what about their other senses? Sight is not the only highly developed sense they have. A recent 2021 study led by Dr. Daniela Rossler investigated an unusual behavior that had been observed before but never properly studied. Looking at Ivarca arcuata, a common European species of jumping spider, she found that while they often curl up in cozy sacks at night, they also sometimes suspend themselves by a thread and seem to sleep, gripping the thread with one rear leg. Now I wrote to Dr. Rossler and asked if zebras did this too, and she replied that she had, in fact, seen them doing it, that just hadn't been published. So this is a thing that these zebra jumpers do. Now this behavior seems unusual as this leaves the spider completely exposed to the elements, and given that these spiders rely so heavily on sight, nighttime puts them at a disadvantage when it comes to evading predators, particularly nocturnal ones. So she wondered why they might do this. We're still not sure what factors influence the decision on any given night, as individual spiders were seen to use both, but making a silk thread is less costly as it requires less silk than making a sack, and the spider doesn't have to navigate back to a retreat it has invested time and material into. How does it defend them from predators, though? Well, their responses to the silk and vegetation disturbances tell us a couple of things. Rossler's team tested three main responses while the spiders were doing this. Disturbing them with light, disturbing the vegetation the silk thread was suspended from, and disturbing the silk line itself. 
Now light made basically all of them climb up the thread. Disturbing the silk made almost all of them drop down to the ground. Disturbing the vegetation made all of the females climb back up the thread, but half of the males climbed up and half of them dropped down. Now the light disturbance isn't surprising since these spiders have such keen eyesight. The response to the vegetation tells us that these spiders can sense the movement and discriminate between an actual object disturbing the vegetation and regular movement due to wind, as these spiders were seen suspending like this even in windy conditions. But they know when something is touching the silk itself, and at that point the only safe escape is straight down. So these spiders can switch from using eyesight as their primary sense during the day to sensing vibrations as their primary sense at night. Now at this point you might be wondering, just how smart are these spiders? Well, probably way smarter than anyone thought a spider could be. These spiders can recognize predators on site, even when the predator isn't moving. Another study by Dr. Rossler just last year, in 2022, tested whether zebra jumpers would pass by different predator-like objects to get to shelter, and how they reacted to the different items. They used a blank spherical object, a spherical object with eyes added that mimicked the eye pattern of a larger jumping spider, a dead Marpissa jumping spider, which is a natural predator of the zebra jumper that occurs where zebras occur in Europe, a dead Phytopus jumping spider, that doesn't occur in Europe, where the test spiders were collected, and a 3D printed model jumping spider, both with and without eyes. None of these test objects were in motion, so the spiders had to rely solely on visual recognition. Now they didn't care much about the blank sphere. They were a little curious about the sphere with the eyes, and paused briefly to examine it before scooting on past it most of the time. When presented with the Marpissa, a co-occurring natural predator, the spiders froze for longer, then retreated. When presented with the even larger Phytopus, they paused for longer still, then noped right out of there. And they retreated from the 3D printed model too, after a significant pause to look at it. What's interesting is that when they were presented with the 3D model with the eyes removed, they paused longer and retreated in a less direct route. So that, combined with the fact that they paused to check out the sphere with the eyes but eventually passed it, suggests that these spiders look for multiple elements of an object to determine if it's a predator. Eyes alone don't do it, but they do get their attention, and they can recognize the shape of a predator even with the eyes removed. So there's some higher level visual processing going on here. Now this behavior does seem innate, as they tested three-day-old captive-bred spiderlings too, who had never encountered a predator before, and they got basically the same results. And possibly a baffling example of potential intelligence in these spiders. In the course of observing Ivarka Arcuata doing their suspended from a thread sleeping thing, Rossler's team noticed a surprising phenomenon. While the spiders were resting like this, there were regular phases with slightly elevated activity, like curling of the legs and twitching of the spinnerets, and they wondered if this was evidence of an REM-like sleep state. So last year, they filmed spiderlings doing it, as the spiderlings were still translucent and the team could see what was going on inside them. And sure enough, the spiders were twitching their retinas back and forth, in exactly the way we flutter our eyes when we're in deep sleep. Whenever they saw the leg curling behavior, the retinas were also doing this twitching thing. Now REM sleep and eye twitching is hypothesized to be directly linked to unconscious visual scene experience. Begging the question, are these spiders actually experiencing visual dreams, just like we do? What are they dreaming about? This opens up a whole world of possibilities and reminds us that when it comes to spiders in general, in the words of MF Land, there is more at this stage to learn than there is to review. So there you have it, Salticus senecus, the zebra jumper. Possibly a good species to look at as a general first foray into jumping spiders as they're very common in most of the northern hemisphere. It's June right now, get outside and look around and you'll probably eventually find one of these fascinating creatures. And as always, if you liked this video or found it helpful, 
Click like, click subscribe, click the bell so you're notified when I put out new videos. Drop me a comment. Do me a favor and share this video with your friends. Annoy your family. Send it to your enemies. You never know. For the past few months, working on these videos is sort of what I've been doing full time, but I won't be able to do that much longer without a big jump in support. So if you're able, go check out my Patreon. There's additional content there that'll be linked below. It's a great way to support the channel and you get some extras as well as my eternal gratitude. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned something about this spider in your house and I hope to see you next time. Cheers. Oh my goodness, jump to the lens of my camera.